Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Corey Choi. I'm the director of Esme My Love, a new uh, film coming out on June 2nd on the internet through Terror Films. You can find the film on www.esmemylove.com. You're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on a genre of entertainment that I have not had in a long time. We are joined by the ever-talented director and writer of an amazing suspense thriller film, which I'll let him describe the name of it. Joined by the ever-talented Corey Choi. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about the film. We're, of course, talking about Esme, My Love. Love the trailer. Love the stills that I got here. Uh, yeah, amazing actresses. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, though, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Do Geeks Talking. Oh, sure. I'm Corey Choi, and I'm a director. I'm a filmmaker. I own Silver Sound in New York City, which is a sound post-production studio. Also, team of location sound recordists. So some folks may know me for my sound work. We're an Emmy award-winning studio. Uh, we got our Emmy for the kids program on ABC called Born to Explore with Richard Weiss. But I also do, in addition to mixing and editing and designing sound for other people's films, I am a director. Esme, My Love is my first feature film. So it's my feature film narrative directorial debut. And it's a psychological thriller slash magical realism piece we're really excited to have gotten distribution in the United States with terror films and internationally we're being represented by Glasshouse Films. We're very, very excited that on June 2nd, something that took from inception till now over six years to create, we're really, really excited that it will be released to the general public. It's had a wonderful indie festival, film festival tour particularly coming out of the pandemic and it being the Indie Festival Tour. I mean, only a few hundred people have seen this film so far. I'm very, very excited for it to be released to the public. If somebody who says, describe this movie to me, it's not fair to ask a director that question because, you know, we all go, oh, you know, my movie's a unicorn, it's unique. I've now gotten used to the kind of like elevator pitch. What is this movie in two words or three words? Compared to other movies, if I, if, just, if you were to take a like a movie mashup, a lot of people have described it as uh, Tree of Life meets The Babadook with a little bit of old joy thrown in there. That's one of Kelly Reichardt's older films. I was in IT for 20 years. I went back to film school uh, for four years at the double major in visual arts and film. So I was more of a, a producer and an editor than, than anything. And it took me like three years just to get my first short film put out there. So I'm glad you finally got your directorial debut. So congratulations on that. That's amazing. Thank you. You know, what is the most misunderstood aspect about the psychological thriller genre that maybe people who don't follow it misunderstand? You know, I can't speak for the whole genre, but I can say for myself, at least a lot of expectation. Is this a horror film? Is it not a horror film. I wouldn't say this is a horror film, even though my distribution company is Terror Films. You know, anyone who's looking for the B-rated experience of like boobs and blood, that's not going to be my film. The psychological thriller, it, this one in particular, it's a slow burn. It's fraught, it, it's tense, and it's not an easy movie. If you want to just sit back and have entertainment come at you, this film probably isn't for you. It's a film that you need to be engaged with. There isn't a whole lot of dialogue in the film. There is, you know, there is dialogue in the film, but there isn't, it isn't wall to wall dialogue. And you can't just glean everything about the movie from the dialogue. It's a full visceral experience. So the visuals, the music, the sound, they're not just augmenting the story, they're integral parts of the story. So it's really important for you to turn up your headphones, have nice headphones, watch it on as big a screen as possible, because it, yeah, it, it's really, it, it's not 
necessarily a simple film, but it, it is a very engaging one if you let it be. So then how did you approach filming this emotional journey of a mother coming to terms with her daughter's illness? Or is she, is what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. This is really the story about a mother-daughter relationship. This is the story that explores that relationship. It's a very unique sort of thing. You know, there's a relationship between a parent and a child is very unique, but there's something very special and different about a mother-daughter relationship. There's a time in every person's life when they realize that their parents may not be infallible, and that's a very pivotal time in every person's life. This kind of explores that a little bit. There's also, I'm a relatively new parent, my eldest is five. There's also just, if you have a child, your boundaries of what you would do to take care of that child may, may you, you might be surprised with yourself just like what that means, just like what everything means to you after you're, you're you know, no longer only responsible for yourself. So it explores that a little bit. While we're in the framework of a psychological thriller and a mystery, it's really just about, mainly about the relationships um, between these two characters, their feelings for each other. Well, we also have to mention, of course, the, the talented actresses that you have as well in, in the film itself. How did you come up with these amazing actresses? And how did you, as a director, create realistic and empathetic portrayals of the scenes that they had together? Audrey Grace Marshall plays Esme. When she auditioned, I, I th think she might have been eight going on nine. When she did the actual filming, she was nine years old, so she was very young. She's an incredible actress. Stacey Weckstein, who plays Hannah, also an incredible actress. When we were doing auditions, which were pretty intense, we did several rounds of auditions and there was room for play. It became clear they just were meant for each other. It worked out. They had just the right amount of physical resemblance, but also the kind of hot and cold between them was, was really fun that they could do. So it could, could get very, very cold. It could get very, very hot. They had great interplay. So, you know, we did our first round of callbacks in the studio. Then we had a second round of callbacks in Prospect Park where, you know, actresses were rolling around in the dirt and talking to each other and, you know, climbing trees and carrying, and, you know, carrying each other and, and stuff like that. And it became very clear that not only were they great actresses, but Stacy in particular was willing to get in there and really put herself both emotionally and physically into the character, which was a pretty demanding role. Based on the trailer itself that I, I got to see, and I, I can't wait to support it uh, any way I can, you know, in, in the digital aspect of things, because it's an amazing uh, portrayal overall from what I'm seeing here. The emotional weight of the story itself and, and creating compelling and engaging narrative, obviously, is, is one of your key strong points as not only a director, but a writer as well, too. Now, how did your actresses take it to the next level in terms of ch maybe challenging scenes that they had to encounter during the filming? I should just point out real quick that I had a co-writer who wrote the script. So I came up with the basic framework and I did some, you know, writing as well. But Laura Allen wrote the screenplay and then I, you know, modified it. So I, I am a writer and she's a writer on the project, but I just want to recognize uh, Laura's role in in the piece, which is really important. We're, we're writing about a, a mother-daughter relationship. There better damn well be a woman writing this with me. It can't you know, it can't just be me. In terms of what Audrey and Stacy brought to the scenes, they're different. Audrey, you know, working with a child actor is very different than working with an adult actor. First of all, you're working with that uh, actor and uh, or act in, and and they're also their acting coach, who in this case was Audrey's mom, Heidi, who is very good. So it's every bit as much, I think, on their acting coach as it is on them because they almost need an interpreter between the director and them sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. And having Heidi there was really, really helpful because, you know, Audrey, she's nine years old, but she's just so well-spoken. She's got such a good vocabulary. She can read. She's like really well. She's, she's so sharp. You forget she's a nine-year-old girl sometimes but you know like between takes she's got her stuffed unicorn she's cracking up you know she's cracking me up and you know doing this and that and the other you know she's a nine-year-old girl and you need to embrace working with a child actor you make that part of the experience so Audrey feels like she's experiencing a lot of the film 
and really gets into Esme's character because she is experiencing something as she goes. And we, we, we tried not to do take after take after take. And Heidi, her mother, was very clear. Let's not over rehearse something because if Audrey's just so focused on memorizing very, very specific words, which she was very good at doing, right? She was very good at memorizing. But if we just focused on the rote memorization, we couldn't get to the the experience. And so if Audrey was to change around a few words here or there, I wasn't going to go, OK, let's just throw this out and do the, the whole script. If, if the intention of the scene stayed in there. Same thing with Stacy. This film was more about the emotional content than the biting, witty dialogue, unless it was mission critical for, for the dialogue to be a very specific way. Uh, I had some flexibility as a director and the actors quickly learned that. They quickly found like a fun framework to, to live with. Then. Beyond that, like Stacy, you know, she didn't have a whole lot of I mean, she had some, but she wasn't like extensive fight choreography experience. She was very down, like I said, physically. Crystal Arnett, our unit production manager and our fight choreographer <laughs> and Stacy, they were down to work on movement together. And I think some it would probably be hard for many people to be faced with so many things to deal with at once. And Stacy was completely game to keep going. She wasn't ever just like, F this, this is too much. You just go go stuff it. Even though like there were many, many hard things she had to do. One of which was, hey, Stacy, can you swim? Great. Hey, Stacy, can you dive? Great. Hey, Stacy, can you dive and hit your mark? And then she goes and does it six times in a row, but she doesn't just hit her mark. She then also intelligibly says something underwater. I mean, that was something she brought to the table. I didn't think that was a, you know, a realistic ask. And she said, well, you know, I've done some underwater modeling before, so I'm actually pretty, you know, used to this. Do you think I should do X, Y, Z? And I was like, yes, please. But, you know, I didn't think that was a reasonable ask. And she's like, well, you know, I can do that. Stacy would do certain things like that in multiple different ways. It was well, very exciting. I was going to ask, what was the most challenging scene for you to film? Underwater is usually pretty difficult, but I'm glad everything worked out well for you. But Oh, uh, no, it didn't, actually. Oh, no? the, the underwater stuff that we did was actually a reshoot because the first time we went to film the underwater stuff, we get out to this island location. We take a ferry. We could only get there once. It was very, it was a very, very small indie budget. We only had a $90,000 shooting budget. So we, we get out to this location and we only had 13 days of principal photography. It's a, like, I think it's the last day of principal photography. We get out to the space. Maybe it's the second to last, I forget. And the underwater housing breaks for the camera, completely useless. I was just like, so we can't do anything underwater now. So we were able to do surface level. And then <laughs> one of our crew members dropped her phone accidentally into the water. And we we're like, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. She's like, oh, no worry. It's the new iPhone. It's waterproof. And I said, give me your phone. And we filmed several shots and a couple shots that made it into the movie. A little bit of underwater stuff with her phone, actually. And, you know, as heartbreaking as that is, because you're moving from your, you know, your anamorphic lenses on an, uh, an Alexa Mini mm -hmm. to your iPhone. Ultimately, we're here to tell a story. It didn't necess necessitate reshoots. A filmmaker is only as good as their crew, the people they work with. I happen to have a kick-ass crew, so I actually felt I was really, really great, um, particularly my cinematographer, Fletcher Wolf. She said, oh, don't worry. I know how to shoot in a swimming pool to make it look like a lake. You just do this, 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 and this, and then drop some leaves in here, have this guy hold this thing over here, and boom. And I was like, wow, because I don't think most cinematographers just at the drop of the hat would know how to handle that. But she's experienced. She's re and if she hasn't done it before, she figures out a way to do it, and she figures out a way to test it. Um, she's absolutely remarkable. So you know there were a lot of challenges, and there are a whole. There's always challenges with indie filmmaking. And many of the challenges were of, you know, just of my own making. And then the biggest challenge was, how do you do something with a very limited amount of money? So everyone's like, well, what would you do differently next time? Somebody should give me a whole lot more money, <laughs> and. <laughs> And I should just be able to solve problems by spending money because if, you know, it's funny, a lot of people say, oh, gosh, you know, on that Hollywood film, they they overcame this, this, that and that. And it's like you just spent lots of money and got really talented people to dedicate time until they figured out how to do it on an indie film. You don't have that like 
giant pool of money. When something goes wrong, you can't just build it again. You have to do something else. And so I'm extremely proud of the fact that, you know, no matter how well you plan, and we planned very well for this film, things are going to go wrong. Uh, for instance, our picture car, uh, one of the very first shots of the film. I had to wrap the crew because we were getting, uh, you know, all, we were about to hit overtime, had to treat them properly like human beings. So they wrapped and I said, oh, no, we were so far behind. We got to get the shot of the car. So my director of photography said, you know what, I'll come. Don't worry about it. We'll put in a couple of hours, just me and you. The car's engine cuts out. We're at the top of a hill. The power steering obviously doesn't work anymore. So I get in the car, we turn on, the only thing that works are the lights because the battery is not quite dead. And uh, <laughs> we push the car down the hill. She, she's at the bottom. I'm steering this dead car with the lights on, with no power steering, get by her and figuring out, okay, when I get past her, now I got to figure out how to get this thing into the grass so because I can't just leave it in the road. And that's the first shot or one of the first shots of our film. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, yeah, th and that's just, you know, one example. Indie filmmaking, when you make a movie, and as someone who's made movies yourself, I'm sure you understand, like, th things just happen. Yeah, it's amazing what you can overcome. There was uh, one point we were filming and we got surrounded by cops. Um, and it was just because we had, uh, we were in a, a warehouse and uh, apparently they were doing a sting on the warehouse that was beside ours. And, oh and, and so we were doing a shootout scene. All fake, no, no, fl no flash or scores. Oh my goodness! And so they surrounded us. I mean, we we got great footage of it. Don't get us wrong, but when you're surrounded by cops with guns drawn and you're trying to shoot a shootout scene, I mean, it adds realism. Don't get me wrong, but we couldn't use the film. We couldn't use that footage. So. No, and that's thank goodness you're alive. Yeah, yeah you know? that, that could have yeah. gone very. That could have gone very, very. That could have gone very, very wrong very quick. Oh, you, oh you, my gosh! Yeah, you've never seen choreographed uh, dropping to the floor hands spread as quickly as an entire film crew can so you know <laughs> <laughs> so i i understand what, what you, where you're coming from with the little little things but the learning experience from these challenges that you face i'm sure is going to inform your decisions in future projects as well too absolutely speaking of which do you have any other upcoming projects once this is since this is all wrapped up and you're you're getting it out there digitally what's the next project that you're going to learn from your previous experiences and make a better film so there's several projects i'm pretty excited about right now one of my short pieces it's an audio only piece called aisha was just accepted into the tribeca festival which will be playing in june at tribeca which is very exciting that's an audio only piece i have i think right now while i'm deciding and trying to figure out representation as a director. Right now, I don't have representation, but I'm looking for it. While I'm figuring that out, I'm going to be concentrating primarily on audio-only pieces because with the resources I have here at Silver Sound, those are going to be the most attainable and I won't have to wait for larger amounts of funding to get things done because I can use the resources available to me. So I have that short piece in Tribeca I'm very excited about. I have a two narrative sci-fi horror one of them sci-fi um drama another one podcasts one that i'm going to produce and one that i'm going to direct it's going to be about eight one hour episodes per per project one is called demo duck and the premise of that is imagine if everything wrong about the internet and social media was actually rolled into a living being and that internet demon decided to take the form of a popular kids cartoon show uh, character and inhabited that cartoon character and started causing mayhem. Um, so that's Demo Duck. And then the arc, which was written and created by my friend Lewis Gordon, which I'm helping produce, in a world where climate change is happening, what's it like to have a child in a society and in a place where resources are dwindling and even just being there physically is a big question and you know how do you have a child in that in that kind of world and there's a big twist that i won't tell it definitely has some i guess matrix like parallels what was the first experience where you learned that language had power oh gosh 
First, anything is really hard for me to, to know. Language has incredible power. I can't remember the first time I realized it, but I can tell you my entire life, you know, language has, particularly now. I think one thing that really brought my attention to language was George Orwell, mm -hmm. an animal farm. And I think maybe that's when I really, really just was brought, when it was brought to my attention to how you could use language for evil. Animal Farm left a huge impression on me. And I, I can't even remember the exact plot twists and turns, but I can tell you that when I see myself and I, I'm encountering this kind of weird dystopic doublespeak that modern politicians use, I just think Animal Farm every single time. You know, without that book, without that rubric, I think I'd be completely lost. I think George Orwell did such a service to me and so many others because it's just like, no, it's that fucking pig. It's just doing it again. And he's saying the exact opposite of what he means. And, but what, you know, and the, the cognitive dissonance, I have a tool, I have a weapon, I have a place of safety and it's Animal Farm. I encourage everybody to read that book because language is so powerful. It's something that's wired into our brains and our beings and as a person, and it's so powerful and it's so dangerous. It can do so many beautiful things as well. I think I was most tuned into it. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's the right answer now that I thought about it. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice <laughs> that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? The second one is, I mean, there's lots of advice. I don't, very bad at ranking things because uh, there's so many different things. I can just tell you one piece of advice that has really stuck with me. You know, particular, do you want me to speak something very, like a very technical thing that I have now just done? Or do you want me to talk about like a more like general, like bring this along with you? Do, do both. Walker, you know? give, give me both. Uh, the very simple technical thing, uh, I studied I studied with um, sound master craftsman Bern Hayden, and he said, when you're mixing, if you're going to sit in a chair, it better not have arms. Don't slouch. You know, your body, you, your posture, you know, alert mind, alert body, better mix. And he would always mix standing up. And subsequently, I always mix standing up. I think it served me incredibly well. Because if I didn't mix standing up, sometimes I might just fall asleep at my chair, just to be honest. Um, but two, it keeps me alert. It keeps my body there. It keeps my mind sharp. And I'm really grateful that he gave me that advice. I, I hadn't ever seen anybody do or, or say that before. It served me incredibly well. So that's just like a very simple uh, piece. In terms of like how to be a person, advice, 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 shut your mouth. <laughs> I say things, I always say what I feel, and I stick my foot in my mouth sometimes because shut your mouth. If you if you don't know the person and you're not sure how they're going to receive it, don't be too familiar too fast. Um, because when I am, I have accidentally and unfortunately, you know, really upset people because they didn't understand who I was or what I was, my intention was. And when I said something, they only saw it on face value and had only had the other people they had encountered before to to weigh it with. And, you know, I hurt some feelings and I angered some people and I creeped out some people by just not thinking about what I'm saying. It could be something as simple as like, wow, I really like the, uh, that dress you're wearing. My grandma used to have a dress like that. And you know that my grandma is very important to me, but to someone who doesn't know my grandmother, um, I, I really offended somebody when I said that. They're, they're, and I, I, it took me a while to realize, oh, they must really not like their grandmother or they don't like the association with being old or, you know, or they don't. So as a half Chinese person, you know, you respect as a Chinese person, you respect and you revere age and you to 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 say, hey, you're 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 on the same plane as my my ancestor, my grandmother, my that's a that's a compliment to an American. Oh. We do not respect our elders. We don't revere age. We think it's like some sort of weakness or something or, or something that's cheesy or to be like, because our, our older generations did such a good job mucking up things for everybody. <laughs> you know, there's just a di cult, totally different cultural thing to say, you know, you remind me of my grandmother, depending on uh, which culture you are. And so I said this to somebody who is American. I was coming at it from a 
place of earnestness, but I really offended them. They were very upset. So I've learned before you know who somebody is and how they'll take something, maybe just don't even go there until, until you know, you don't say more than is necessary. Keep it simple. Yeah, keep it simple. And you put the other one, K-I-S-S. Yeah, yeah. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Wow. Um, there are so many people that inspire me. I think the person I'm going to highlight right now was my paternal grandmother, Grace Choi. I named my daughter after her, Grace Choi. Grandma Grace was a bit of an iconoclast. She was very, very proud American, but she's Chinese American. I'm half Chinese. I think of all the people that I would like to inspire and, and I want to be more like, it always comes back to my grandmother, Grace, whether it's through her persistence, her ability to really, truly empathize with everybody, her no-nonsense, cut-the-crap attitude, and her insistence that just being a little bit different, being a little bit original, is very important. You need to stand out from the crowd. Uh, I remember, you know, this is the worst advice ever, but she was always telling me to crumple up my college applications or, or maybe, like, you know, spit on them or something so that the paper was a little bit different, so it would just, like, come out from the stack a little better. I was like, that's terrible advice, Grandma. And she was like, do it. Uh, she also gave me some really good advice as well. And so, yeah, I guess the person that I will highlight right now, but there are many, many people that I draw inspiration from is my grandma, Grace. From a professional standpoint, you are a very successful audio engineer slash magician slash amazing person in that regard, but you're also now a an amazing director in that regard as well, too. So congratulations on your amazing path in your life so far. And can't wait to see what you do in the future as well. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I'm always learning and I'm always growing. And I may not always be growing, you know, physically at some point, or maybe even now I'm going to start losing things like my hair is turning gray. I'm losing a little hair, you know, I'm going to start shrinking, but, <laughs> or growing that, you know, that way instead of up. But um, in terms of my craft and what I do, I'm always learning. I think everybody's always learning and you can always be better and do new things. I'm incredibly lucky and privileged to be able to do what I do. My goal is to help people tell stories, to tell stories myself and allow people and me to make my living doing that. And that's what I wanna do. I wanna tell important stories, impactful stories that not only are beautiful for their own sake, but people will take with them and change how they feel or look at certain things. I'm incredibly lucky, I would say, and privileged to be where I am, and, and I love it. And so if that's success, I think so. But there's, you know, in terms of um, being able to learn more about my craft and other people and tell stories, I can always improve. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Not well. <laughs> Sometimes I yell and throw things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, you know, I have a very hot temper. And so I'll be like, ah, and man, I don't really throw things. That's, that's not true. I don't throw things, but sometimes I get, I have a very burst, a big first burst of anger. Then I'll start thinking about the situation. I'm trying to like quash down on the temper and just start thinking about the situation. That would probably help. Failure happens all the time. I fail all the freaking time. That's part of what helps you succeed later. And how do you deal with it? I mean, you always want to be able to deal with it graciously, but depending on the magnitude of the failure and whether it's something that you kind of brought on yourself or that was brought on upon you by uh, outside forces really changes. You know, the ones that I really just bring on myself are the ones I take hardest because it's really on me to not have failed in that way. When there's outside circumstances, I think you feel the most helpless, but those are the ones that are instructive where you can kind of like pick yourself up more easily. It's easier to do reflection when there's kind of an external thing to think about. When it's all just you, it's a little bit hard to make yourself good cop and bad cop at the same time, if that makes sense. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. The fact that you have the younger generation currently with you, looking up at you as an inspirational person when they grow up, maybe you're going to inspire them to become creative in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? 
Well, my daughter already inspires me, so and she's inspiring her little brother. He's beginning to sing a little bit. Uh, I think she sings. He's almost two. She's five. And, you know, she's already a very, very sharp and emotion-filled person. I hope she, as a young child, you only have so much empathy. She has some, and she she definitely is very emotional and even now a little nostalgic, but I hope that she develops more empathy. I think my work, what I hope to be able to achieve with my work is to help people recognize the connections between each other and with each other, just how wonderful human connection is. So I hope to be able to pass that on to her and my son, um, and I hope they use that kind of love for the human spirit and the beauty of nature, and I, I hope they um, are able to make that into something that's their own that will inspire others. If your life was a movie, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be since you're an audio guy as well? Uh, I just redid my website and uh, we decided to go really, really hyperbolic with the new tagline for Silver Sound. And we were like, you know what? We're in age, you're talking about importance of language. So we were like, we're going to go really hyperbolic and we're just going to put it out there. No Fs given. And so our new tagline for our website is unparalleled sonic artistry. That's very unabashed. You know, it's out there like, yeah, come on, bring it. We're going to do something awesome here. So, you know, title for my life, title for my website, that's kind of the same thing, right? What was the second part of the question? What? Depends on the day. You know, it would have to be a playlist. But for today, uh, very specifically, Unity by Operation Ivy. Well, Corey, I do hate to say, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. So it's a real privilege to be on the show. Thank you. If people want to see my film, if they go to EsmeMyLove.com on June 2nd, when it comes out, you can just go to EsmeMyLove.com. It'll take you to all the different flavors on the Internet. You can watch it there. If you want to get a DVD or a Blu-ray, you can order it directly from the website. And we will be burning them one at a time and sending them out because we don't know how many people like physical things anymore um, in this weird digital world. But I personally value di uh, you know, physical pieces. So I, it was very important to me that at least it would be possible for people to get a DVD or a Blu-ray of the film. I, I really hope you do get a chance to watch the film. And I hope um, folks will want to watch the film. Uh, we feel, our team feels like it's not just another movie. We, we feel like we've done something pretty beautiful and important. And we hope that uh, you get to, to share it with us. I'm mainly just my website, coreychoy.com. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and 1,200 plus others because I've been doing this since 2008. So, oh, gosh. yeah, it's, it's been a while. Uh, and our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. Our website's going through a revamp. So you can find us on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 years because reasons. And I'm only one person, which is twogeekstalking.podbean.com. Or just search for Two Geeks Talking on any of your favorite streaming services like iTunes, Spotify, and everything like that. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.